What you fix to do today, man? Damn. Man, I don't know what you fix to do. I got plans to get my ass up off this block. We're gonna get up off this hill plantation, get up off this block, and we gonna walk. We're gonna walk right up to that river, man. So we gonna stand there like chosen, like this world they never see. Hello, I'm Callum Finley and welcome to Chatterbox, episode two. I'm an actor and writer as well as an associate artist and alumnus of Playbox Theatre. Another week in isolation, but we did it. I hope you all signed up for your permaday from poets.org as suggested by last week's guest, Juliet Stevenson. Juliet's other lockdown suggestions, for those of you who missed it, were a website called Culture Whisper, which has information about unusual cultural happenings around the UK, and an app called iBird, which helps you to work out what birds you're seeing out your window. Turns out I've got house martins in the garden. Who knew? If you want to catch up on Juliet's Chatterbox episode, you can head over to youtube.com forward slash playbox theatre. Now, before we meet our guest this week, just a quick reminder that we want you to get involved in these conversations as well. So you are able to ask questions to our guests via Zoom's Q&A function. If you hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen on a laptop, on the top of your screen on a mobile, then you'll be able to find a button to click and send questions directly into my inbox. You'll also be able to see the questions other people have asked and to vote for the ones you'd like to hear answered. The more votes, the higher up the pile they go. And I promise we'll try and get through as many as we can. If you're watching live on YouTube, fear not. Though you can't message in questions, you can still get involved by helping to support Playbox Theatre. I was a member of Playbox Theatre right up until 2009 when I headed off to drama school. Not only did they inspire my love of the arts, but I know I wouldn't have got in without them. And right now they need all of our support to make it through the months ahead. So please, please head over to playboxtheatre.com forward slash donate and give whatever you can afford to. Every single penny will. I promise, make a huge difference. Now, as you may have noticed from the trailer we showed you at the start, today I've invited Papa S.E.A. Du to be my Chatterbox guest. Now, Papa needs no introduction, but I'll do it anyway. A Guildhall graduate, he started his professional career at the Orange Tree Theatre in Richmond before joining the Royal Shakespeare Company in 2012. There, he was nominated for an Ian Charleston Award for his performance of Fenton in The Merry Wives of Windsor and if memory serves me correctly, where he also played a character called Pizza Rat in the RSC's Christmas show, The Mouse and His Child. His relationship with the RSC has gone from strength to strength. Not only is he an associate artist and board member of the organization, but he was also a multi-award winning Hamlet in 2016, a production that the BBC is about to broadcast. In 2014, he stepped in and saved a production of King Lear at the National Theater when the actor playing Edmund lost his voice a role he later played alongside Anthony Sher at the RSC. He's worked at the Royal Court, the Young Vic in the West End, and his screen career has been just as illustrious. I'm talking press on the BBC, Kiri on Channel 4, and even Mur Murder on the Orient Express alongside Kenneth Branagh and Johnny Depp. He was named one of BAFTA's Breakthrough Brits in 2018, and just yesterday, his new TV show, Gangs of London, premiered on Sky. Papa, thank you for joining our second Chatterbox session. Oh, How are you holding so up in much. isolation? Uh, um, I am doing all right, you know. The sun is shining, which is a little bit of a, a, a tease for us inside these walls. But, like, yeah, I'm not doing too bad so far. I'm trying to stay sane of body and mind, really. Very good. Now that links quite nicely to our first question, which is from Juliet Stevenson last week. She says, and I'm quoting, hello, Papa, lots of love to you. What are you learning about yourself during lockdown? Are you finding things out about yourself? If you are, are you prepared to tell us what? 
Um, yeah, it's quite interesting, actually, I've found, because obviously this is like quite an unprecedented state of being for all of us, especially, I guess, for our actors, performers, we're such a social tribe, you know, like we're always out and about and like the very nature of what we do demands other people. It's not, it's not, it's not generally as um, so, so solo as this. But I, I, I always thought that I was a bit of an extrovert or I had like extrovert um, tendencies, but I think I'm actually low key a bit of an introvert basically because a lot of the time that I've, especially for the first three or four weeks, I've really enjoyed kind of like having time to, um, to look at myself, analyze myself and spend time like doing things that I want to do, which usually with, with a busy schedule, you don't really get. The opportunity to do so you learn a lot about yourself just by being with yourself which I guess you don't really get to do that much um when you're working from day to day now talking about a busy schedule you were performing in Passover at the Kiln Theatre in London which we just saw the trailer for when yeah. COVID-19 took hold um what was it like being told that you were having to close such a successful show early yeah, obviously it's disappointing to close a show, not not necessarily because of its success, but more because of the story that we were telling and and um, the effectiveness of that story being communicated to the audiences. I, we, I feel that we managed to put together a really good production of that particular play. Um, so it's always disappointing for that to happen, but in the grand scheme of things, um, it's very difficult to get your tail up about uh, uh, about your play not being able to go on anymore when um, there's there's definitely far, far more scary and pressing issues out there. Um, and yeah, we hope we hope that we'll be able to pick up. Also, we're very fortunate in the fact that we got to do five weeks of our run. I've got friends who had done like their first or second pre and then down or final week of rehearsal processes and then got shut down so that's way worse at least we got an opportunity to do it but yeah we hope that we'll be able to bring it back again one day I hope you are able to bring it back because it was such a I mean genuinely electrifying and uh, fierce show uh, for anyone who's not seen it it was um, partially at least about uh, two black males experiencing violence at the hands of a white police officer and I mentioned race there only because it's relevant to the production. Um, and although the, the play is set in America, it felt to me that it had a lot to say about race divides here in the UK, particularly yeah. perhaps stop and search, uh, things like that. Are those are those transatlantic links something that you discussed in rehearsal? Yeah, hundred percent. And I think especially um, in the way that our um, a lot of our processes are kind of like cultural references, pop culture, even education. The way that we're trained to think and understand racism with a capital R, let's say, is through the lens of an American eye, you know? So we think about slavery in America, we think about the civil rights movement in America, we think about the Black Lives Movement in America, um, as if that's something that happens over there and not over here. But I think it's it's obvious and um, people of colour all over the country will tell you that um, just because our police um, men and women aren't armed, so aren't literally shooting people down every day, even though that has happened in in the, in the recent past. Um, that there is still like a systemic and historical history and conflict between those two things in this country. So I think that play, and obviously, like you say, the plays about that and um, a lot of other things, but that play to me, especially when I read it, never felt um, exclusive to America. It felt like it was set in America and was probably born in America, but it's a story that speaks to um, cultures all over the world. I would, I, I would agree with that. Now, it had, it had quite a small cast, a brilliant cast, of just there were just three of you. Um, mm. Is that a different experience to, say, being in a big company like Hamlet? Does that change the dynamic in the rehearsal <laughs> Yeah, it really does. It, 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 it it's really interesting. I because when when we started rehearsals for it, I realised that I hadn't been in a cast of less than I don't know seven or something since my first job, which we were just talking about the at the Orange Tree, which is two hundred. So I haven't done a small cast show for a long time, and it kind of means that you don't really have an opportunity for 
to kind of like hide for a little bit you know the scrutiny is always on all of you so like if you turn up and you're a little bit tired or you've had a big night the night before which obviously you should never do uh, <laughs> or whatever is affecting your concentration or your commitment or whatever it's, it's there for all to see so I mean it's good it's a challenge because it means that every single moment is rich and juicy for you to invest yourself in and you're going to get a lot of attention and 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 people are going to meet you halfway on that but um yeah it, it, it's, it's 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 a different demand i think from larger 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 casts larger casts like hamlet which we should talk a little bit about probably um now i've known you ages but i've i've never asked this before um what was it like getting the phone call saying hey you're going to play hamlet at the rnc <laughs> <laughs> um it's um it's very different to how you imagine it in your mind's eye actually um so like i auditioned a few times for the part and it was definitely it was over a long period of time it was over about four months or something so for the majority of those four months i was like very very stressed and anxious and nervous and certain that it wasn't happening for me and then um yeah i got the call from my agent telling me that they wanted to, to offer me the part and yeah of course for like 10 seconds maybe there's like jubilation elation euphoria you feel like you're 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 being recognized in the world for 10 seconds and then they're the most intense fear and panic and um overwhelming um dread kind of like washes over you like a bucket of ice cold water because you're like you're like wow I have I actually have to do this thing you know but yeah I was quite lucky in the fact that I got given like maybe I, I found out maybe like five months or six months before we started rehearsal so you that was good in one way in that I had time to prepare but also I had time to think <laughs> it's funny you say that it was a bit daunting because I remember you um begging me not to come and see Passover before press night <laughs> <laughs> which I ignored and of course it was and you were brilliant but, um, do you find it difficult when you're in the process of making something to have perspective on how it might be taken yeah yeah I'm I'm a real overthinker when it comes to that kind of stuff because um, yeah there's, I, especially in theatre I think there's something about the medium of theatre where like there are so many unknowns until you do it like especially with um yeah, plays with previews, you learn so much. I, th I think you only know like maybe 50 or 60% of what a play is going to be like or how or how you're going to do something by the first preview. And you learn huge amounts over the previews and the first weeks and the second weeks and all the way through to the final performance, you should still be learning, I think. But um, yeah, it, if I, I always feel in that first preview like, why would anyone do this to me by turning up? Because I, I don't even know what's going to happen, yet, let alone like you pay to, for a ticket. So thank you for um, going against my advice. <laughs> but was that, was that a similar thing when you did Hamlet? Because I guess unlike a new play, perhaps, we sort of know that Hamlet's foundations are fairly solid. Hmm. Yeah, but I mean, okay, so that, there's a different challenge there because with a new play, it's never been done before and the expectations are kind of limited. You, the, I mean, no one knows what, no, no one's got any expectations of what they're going to see, where, whereas with Hamlet, there's such a precedent and everyone's got their idea of what Hamlet should be like and how it should be played and what the production should be and how to be or not to be should be stressed, you know? Like, so many, everyone's got, like a whole thesis, thesis on that so that's a different kind of pressure and before your first preview but like actually I think I actually was a little bit less nervous at that point just because like we had quite a chaotic tech rehearsal and we nearly had our first preview cancelled actually so it was definitely more of like sorry there's a bad background noise it was definitely more of a kind of like fight or flight type um, approach to it and the so survivalist instincts kicked in from the whole cast and community you know all the creators or whatever. there was there's a real sense of we've got a fight to make this happen so it's it's easier not to be nervous during tech what had happened during tech i think um 
like I don't really want to go into the ins and outs of automatum, <laughs> automation at the RSC, but I think there was, let's say there were some technical issues um, and certain things that were quite crucial to the work, to the, the rendering of our production didn't work as well in actuality as, as we had hoped. But, um, but we did it. We did it, and it, and the first night audience was and always is great in Stratford, um, really responsive, and a whole lot of things went wrong. But again, that's quite a good thing to happen on the first preview because it's like, well, at least it, at least that's not going to happen again. Well, Anna Flynn um, says that her parents were in the audience one night for Hamlet when a when a woman collapsed. She wants to know how, as an actor, you prepare and deal for those situations if you can. If if someone collapses in the audience, yeah, how is how do you deal with that when it happens? I think um, I think when you're doing a play, and especially in a theatre like the Royal Shakespeare Theatre, where you've got audience on all three sides, and at certain points they're quite close to you, you've got a real connection with them. It, it hasn't got that same fourth wall separation type thing, so. In the same way as, as they've got a kind of a qu- quite tactile feeling for you, you've got to kind of like feel them as well. So I think people, like actors in those kind of stages are very attuned to what's happening in audiences. So when things, when, to, when, when you can feel something going wrong or feel, um, um, yeah, especially when someone's in danger, when, when there's something like that. And that, I think that has happened to us in productions before. Often the actors know about it before the stewards do, you know. So it's that same kind of like readiness and immediacy that is needed to kind of do spontaneous acting. It's that same thing that you're pulling on in terms of like connecting with your audience. So when that happens, often you can instinctively respond to it. Wow. Now, I imagine one of the hardest bits of playing Hamlet, as you know, aside from the thousands of lines, the emotional turmoil, the fight after three hours on stage. Um, is 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 as you said, having to say to be or not to be, because they're the sort of, they're the most famous lines in theatre ever, right? And were like yeah. famous right from the Elizabethan period. They were quoting it. So there's like 500 years of fame in those lines. Why do you, why do you think those lines and that soliloquy are so famous? Do you think there's something in them that we're sort of attracted to? Um. That's actually a really good question. I haven't really thought about why they're so famous before because because they are so kind of like synonymous with English language and Shakespeare. So I've never really questioned why those lines. I also think it's just, it's, it's quite telling. When you're doing it um, and, you say, and you come out and you say those first words, you, you always see audiences kind of like lean forward and people who previously been sleeping to suddenly wake up and, <laughs> and, and and people start like mouthing along to it you know but they only ever know the first line they only ever know to be or not to be that's the question and they don't know the rest of it and oh I mean some people don't know the rest of it <laughs> and the rest of the speech is incredible still you know so like it's a great opening hook into people's minds and imaginations and historical recognitions but that hook is actually useful because it gets them engaged for the rest of the speech, which is where the real meat and the real huge questions are asked. Um, and it's good to have an audience that's with you for for that, you know. Um, and yeah, the, that's what that's one of the great things about Shakespeare and soliloquies. Like you're speaking to the audience, you're looking at the audience, you're asking questions of the audience. Um, so that allows some of that pressure to be released a little bit if you stop speaking if you stop thinking of it as a speech and definitely stop thinking of it as a famous speech and if you can kind of like get that out of your mind and start kind of like just asking real people in front of you questions it, it, it's way more straightforward or at least I found it so. yeah I, well I, it's so great then that because I remember seeing that and as as you know, and a fellow actor, I found it a really awe-inspiring performance from you and indeed the whole thing, an exhilarating production. Um, and I think it's so great then that the BBC is about to broadcast it. Uh, and for anyone who might be watching who's worried about Shakespeare being really long or difficult to understand, this production is a real sort of 
gateway drunk, for want of a better word, into Shakespeare in a way that's sort of really uncondescending. Um, it was almost like a thriller, as I remember it. Was that something that you were sort of consciously thinking about when you made it? Yeah, I mean, um, me and Simon Godwin, who was the director of the productions, we, we sat down a few times before we started rehearsing and we, we kind of like spent a lot of time discussing and thinking about what kind of production that we wanted to do. And clarity was always at the front of our, at the forefront of our minds. We never wanted something that was opaque or something that was esoteric or something that was showy-offy. We wanted something that was clear and that, and the story at the centre of that play, even though it is wrapped up in philosophy and psychology and fame and whatever, but the story at the centre of it is thrilling and is exciting and is compelling, you know? So we wanted an opportunity to set that free. And in a way, it was kind of like a good thing that I was the person playing Hamlet because no one knew who I was in a different way to um, some more famous Hamlets like David Tennant who had done it before me at the RSC or... And it come back or Michael Sheen or like or, or Andrew Scott in the production that you were in. Um, sometimes it's good to have the kind of like star vehicle type thing removed from the audience's um, vision, so they're not kind of like secretly thinking about how they can video Benedict Cumberbatch doing a speech or whatever, you know, and they can actually just like watch the play and hear the story, you know. So like. That was what we wanted to do from the beginning, and yeah, I think I think I, was, I, I, I thought we did a, a decent job in terms of actualizing that. Yeah, I would agree. I think you're going. We're going to have loads more Hamlet questions coming in. I think so. I'll I'll leave that there. Um, but I'd like to sort of jump back a little bit in time in your life because we've got we've got loads of young people who'll be listening to this who love theatre and the arts, and who may be facing sort of big decisions about what they want to do with their lives. Mm. And I know you turned down a place at UCL to train as a doctor mm. to go to drama school. Um, and this links into a question, actually, that's come in from Nia Crookford. Uh, it, you know, were there any points that were you questioned whether that was the right route? Or did you ever face people telling you to do something more reliable? Yeah, 100%. I still do, you know. And, like, um, it felt, I remember it felt really um, indulgent, I think, to go to drama school because like I I kind of like was brought up in a low income family, single parent family, um kind of really fortunate to kind of achieve academically, I guess, and to get offered those opportunities. So it felt like a big thing to walk away from that, you know, to be able to have like a proper profession that was lifelong stability and was kind of respected you know but like for me at that age it was about doing something and like I think to be fair I think I probably would have loved being a doctor but it was about doing something number one that I didn't even know if I could do so I didn't kind of like grow up going to youth theatres or doing huge amounts of acting I'd only done like a couple of plays or something before before I went to drama school and I'd done the National Youth Theatre so I didn't even know that it was something I could do but it did feel fundamentally like it fed something inside me and it fed something and challenged something and and um, inspired and set alight something inside of me. And I don't think everyone is fortunate enough to have those things. You know, not everyone, especially in the way like we're educated in this country, not you're, you're often at that age before you're 18, you don't know what those things that really, really spark a passion inside you are. So if you do have those things, um, you're, you're, you're really lucky. And that's, I think, why I did what at the time felt like a really mad thing to go in the opposite direction to medical school. But by, by no means is that the be all and end all. And like, it's not necessarily about knowing exactly what you want to do at 18 or 17 or 19 or whatever. L loads of the best actors that I know, or best whatevers I know, like, didn't start until they were 25 or 30 and they've had a whole other lives and careers before they, which have kind of fed them and kind of um, informed the way that they, they, they perform, you know? So I, I think I was lucky to at least like have an idea of what that thing might've been then, but it, yeah, that's not the be all and end all by any means. Now it's probably time for us to hear some of the many, many questions that have been pinging away 
uh, in my inbox. Um, but before we do, as we're here in support of Playbox Theatre, we thought you should meet a member of Playbox. So Rich, our technical wizard, is going to magic Bavan onto your screen to ask you a question in person. Um, now, Bavan is a really committed member of Playbox's weekly theatre workshops. Uh, she was recently cast in Start Swimming in the studio theatre. Um, and last week, she put some excellent questions to Juliet Stevenson. Um, uh, Bavan, are you there? Are you appearing on my screen? Oh, here she comes. Bavan, if you can hear... Ah, there you are. And you might need to unmute yourself. Hi, Bavan. Hello. Um, how are you doing, Bavan? How are you holding up in isolation? Good. It's not too bad, but yeah, still got school. Of course. Yeah, that must be difficult online. Mm. Yeah, but it's, it's all right. Going through it, it's fine. <laughs> Um, so, what is your question for Papa? Um, so, obviously, as an Asian myself, uh, I'd sort of just be interested to hear your views on whether you think sort of um, being from an ethnic minority has helped or hindered your career and sort of any barriers that you may have faced and how they were overcome. Yeah, I mean, it's, re it's a really good question. Um, is it Bavin or Bavin? Or how do Bavin. I pronounce that? Bavan. Uh, like Bavan, um, yeah. Bavan. Okay. Yeah, it's a really good question. And um I think like in through realistic eyes, it's a bit of both, right? Um I think in terms of like if we again talk about racism, that's something that permeates um all kind of like levels of our society, unfortunately, and often in ways that are like quite unconscious. You know, so a lot of the barriers or um, impediments that I might have, I'm, I might have faced, or other people might face, um, I might not even ever know about or hear about. You know, um, but in terms of like, I, I, I find it difficult to talk about like making things work to your advantage because I think that's quite cynical. But I do believe in this idea of like celebrating your eunice, your individualness. And um, that's one of the things that makes up my eunice, you know, and makes up your eunice and all of us, you know. And and that's informed by who you are, where you came from, what your gender is, what your interests are, what your education is. All of these things kind of like combine to make you. And like, I feel like I've always felt most comfortable and actually had most success when I really sat into that as opposed to trying to be a certain type of person, trying to ape a certain type of person. So like trying to talk in a certain accent, for example, or um, trying to, or, or, or kind of like rejecting like any parts of my culture or anything like that. I feel like at times when I've really lent into that and celebrated that and pushed that and kind of been unabashed and unashamed about that, that's where I've had most um, most success. So I think it's about, um, so I, I'd never say, look, it's a really exciting time to be a whatever actor, so use it to your advantage. I think that's really cynical and whatever. But like, I do think it is a really courageous and brave thing to truly, truly like love yourself and celebrate yourself. If you can do that, um, it should help you. Does that answer your, your question, Bavan? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Amazing. Thanks for, ask thanks for asking. Um, excellent. Now, Papa, before we put some more questions to you, we're going to launch um, a little poll. For those of you participating in the webinar, you can vote for which of Papa's stories, horror stories, he called them, that you'd like to hear at the end. Uh, your options are, uh, number one, saving the day during the NT's production of King Lear, and option two, um, Papa's first ever screen audition. They should be uh, popping up in front of you now. You've not got long to vote. Um, and just a quick reminder for anyone watching at home, you can head over to playboxdata.com forward slash donate if you want to help support the future of this remarkable company who specialise in making work for and by young people. Amazing. OK, let's take it over to some of these questions that have been coming in in my inbox. So right at the top here, this is from Ed Buckley. It's had loads of votes here. Everybody wants to hear the answer to this. Um, when you're approaching a character in Shakespeare that has been repeated a hundred times over, how do you try and breathe new life into the character? Um, and Ruby adds to that, she's commented on that question to say she wants to know what are your tips for maintaining the physical and mental stamina whilst playing such an intense role? So there's two, two mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, like I would always try, like, and this is just a personal thing. I try to kind of stay away from other versions of parts that I've, that I've, uh, that uh, other versions of parts that I'm playing. Right. So, for example, Passover has been done before in the um, in America, and Spike Lee um, directed a version of it that's on Amazon Prime. Which, once upon a time, I was like, oh wow, this is really good research material to kind of watch that and and see how they did it. But I actually find then I start thinking about how can I do it differently from that? How can I do, how, how can I do it better or how, how can I make it mine? And I don't think that is a particularly useful thing to have as a focus of your mind when you're attaching a, yourself to a character. Just by the very virtue of the fact that you are you, you will come up with your own unique version of a character um, in the way that you read it, in the way that you interpret it, in the way that you then perform it. No one's got the brain that you've got. So I I kind of tried to block out all the other noise and just look and analyze a play and the text and the character and think about the things that I find interesting, that I find scary about it, the questions that I've got about it, and try and answer them truthfully to myself. And usually that kind of comes up, that comes out with something authentic and generally different from things that other people have done, just by virtue of the fact that I'm me and other people are them. Um, in terms of like keeping, so what was that? That was physical and mental stamina, was it? Yeah, was, yeah. That's I. I find that I find the audience really useful for that because, <clears throat> again, especially in theatres, like the audience is different every night, and the audience will give you one sort of reaction one night, and the other and another sort of reaction another night, and you're always in the death hole when you're trying to replicate what you did the night before, right? So like if you did a line in a certain way and it got a big laugh and you're like, you walk off stage really chuffed with yourself, yeah, smashed it, whatever. Um, you go on stage the next night and try to do it exactly the same way. Number one, you mess it up. And number two, the audience give you back nothing, right? Because you're not respecting, you're not respecting the spontaneity and you're not respecting the individuality of each audience. So each audience is different. So you have to train yourself to kind of have an openness and a curiosity about the audience that's in front of you. And that I think kind of like pushes you into a state of readiness and a state of um, immediacy that allows you to stay physically connected and stay emotionally connected as much as you can. But also in, in, in terms of stamina, I think that's about like eating well, sleeping as much as you can, making sure you're well rested. Um, and yeah, stay in, stay, stay, stay in as fit as you can, I think. That's great. Um, Ruby Riley would like to know, um, how do you think you can fully show your potential within an audition process? <laughs> fully show your potential? Fully. Fully um, show. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's challenging. Auditions are hard, you know, and um, I think we kind of, uh, I wouldn't say waste, but we spend so much energy trying to second guess what the other person is looking for and what they think of us and what, what will make them like us. It's, it's natural, we're human beings, we want to be liked and like the way audition processes are set up, of course, there's like someone who's got what you want, so you want to do what they want to get it. Right, but I mean, it, 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 I think you get there. You 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 understand this. Number one, the more you audition, and actually, the more time you spend on the other side of the table. So, if you ever get an opportunity to direct or to cast or produce whatever, you see this. Like, um, it's not necessarily always about you and about showing your potential or about making them like you or whatever. And that's not in your power anyway. So I think in that in that case, it's really important to focus on what is in your power and what is in your control. And that's to make an offer. So like if you prepare well for an audition and you have the you you've got the right questions and you've got the right um things that you're interested in about a character and about a scene or whatever, that gives you something that you can give as an offer to the people that audition, directors, casting directors, whatever. Um and that's all you can do. And all you can do is do that to the best of your ability. And that generally comes with 
lots of preparation and just like breathing and making sure you're as calm as possible whatever allows you to be as relaxed as possible um once you get into an audition room but I think focus less on trying to say the second guess what you might think that they might want and focus more on what you find interesting and exciting about a piece or a scene or whatever and offering that to the people that are auditioning you. That's great. Um, and this, this question sort of takes us a step before that, before you get to the audition. This is from mm. uh, an anonymous attendee. They would like to know. Um, it's, you. <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> you actually hear the question. <laughs> um, what steps could a new actor take to get close to the, their dream of working with the RSC? Oh, mate, you could have just texted me. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, can you ask that one more time? Yeah, what steps could a new actor take to get closer to their dream of working with the RSC? Mm, okay, um, well, the RSC have, are kind of like historically like really interested in new actors. Every single year they take on um, people who have never worked there before, especially young actors. Um, and that's how me and Callum both first got um, hired by them, uh, first year out of drum school, I think. Yeah. And I think you can help yourself by obviously having an interest in Shakespeare, not necessarily in, um, I don't mean like you have to read like the complete works and have like four different opinions on every single pro production there's been of Titus Andronicus or whatever, but like think about like what excites you about uh, Shakespeare and think about what plays you like and why you like them and when if you get an opportunity to watch productions of Shakespeare uh, wherever in London in at the RSC around the country think about like what kind of actors and what kind of performances um, releases the story for you and allows you to access these stories and characters and then start analyzing what they're doing that allows them to do that you know, and I think like, yeah, it's one, like with Shakespeare, it's one of those where the more you do and the more you read and the more you watch, the more you understand. I still remember the first time that I watched a Shakespeare play and I think it was Macbeth or something. And I was like, I feel like the, the there's a couple at the center of this that like maybe don't like each other or aren't like particularly functional or something, but like... And someone's someone's been killed. Some oh, and there's a ghost. Like I, 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 in terms of like the literal word to word type um, understanding of it, it took a long time for me personally um, to get to that. But like, I always found it interesting and exciting. So just by watching more and reading more and being more curious, it's allowed me to get better at it and have a better understanding of it. So now, like when I go and watch Shakespeare, I understand maybe like half of it. <laughs> well, um, so Joe Barlow, who's 14, um, wants to know uh, what tips you have for learning Shakespeare for a, a, for a stage production. Is there any sort of process that you have for, for learning, as you said, those words that can be a bit difficult? Yeah, I mean, especially to begin with, and I actually still use this now, um, there's a website called No Fear Shakespeare. Um, which I think has all the Shakespeare plays on it. And um, it basically goes through each play and line for line paraphrases um, the Shakespearean verse or prose into modern everyday language. And I still do that for, if I'm looking at a speech where there's like some like quite like obscure reference to, like he's full of like references to, like I remember when me and Callum were doing a, uh, I played. There was a reference to a Banbury cheese, which uh, at, not coming from the Midlands, Banbury to me, I, I don't know, I've clue what that was. You know, so like going on on no no fear Shakespeare kind of says, oh, Banbury is a town in blah blah blah, and cheese is something that you eat. And, you know, um, I, I I find that a really good in and key into. Um, those plays because once you start understanding what's being talked about and why he specifically used this kind of idea this kind of image um to to get this point across it really allows you to get under the mechanisms of the play and then you can start getting excited by i don't know pentameter or poetry or whatever but yeah, yeah no, fear, no 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 fear shakespeare if you just google that it's a really good um uh, place to, to to get some help that's great. And um, B Baldwin, 
would like to know, have you ever struggled with self-confidence or stage fright and how did you overcome it? Oh God! I mean, yeah, still every single play. Like as as Callum has so kindly outed me publicly for, <laughs> um, I I I get really, especially in the early parts of plays, I get really nervous. Um, it's about people who come to watch it and what they're going to think, and I, I'm always certain I'm going to be terrible. It's going to be the end of my career. I'm always like, why did I take this job? It was going so well. I've tricked so many people. Um, why did I, 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 I took that one step too far, right? Um, so yeah, that's about self-confidence. Uh, uh, well, I mean, I don't know why, if that's about self-confidence, but I think that is about, un, it's, it's not a useful way of like putting your energy through something. I always find like the more that I can focus on the task at hand and the more clarity I've got about like what I'm doing, what my intention is, um, the more relaxed I can be, you know? And that comes with experience, of course, and that comes with like doing it a few times. But um, it's okay, I think, to not immediately think that, not immediately not think that you're the most amazing actor the world has ever seen. And I think it's probably quite useful to have a little bit of humility because at least that that kind of like pushes you into a position where you want to get better and you want to learn more and you want to and you're happy to mis- make mistakes, but then you can. And observe them and not make them again that's what experience does to you so it's not necessarily about thinking yeah I'm the guy right now and I know everything because you're probably not but it is about thinking about what you find difficult what you find easy and analyzing that and doing it again and trying to learn from from those things amazing another anonymous one for you um you have that you have already played one of Shakespeare's most well-known characters in Hamlet, but what character, male or female, do you most want to play? Brackets or wish you had? Oh wow! Like Shakespearean? I think that's what they're getting at. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um, male or female? I kind of like. I mean, I think there are some like, amazing Shakespearean women. But, like, I kind of feel a little bit weird about, like, putting myself forward for those parts because, like, there are so few good female roles in Shakespeare. Like, I don't think the women of the Shakespearean acting community need me to be taking another one off the table for them. So <laughs> I'm going to leave that though, those to um, other people. But... Um, yeah, there are loads of there are loads of parts that I'm really interested in. I'm I'm not again one of those actors that's like yes, I'm ready to give my you know Richard the Third or or Macbeth or whatever. It's always about the for me. It's always about the production and what's interesting about that particular play or particular production. But like I love so many Shakespearean plays, so like all the ones that you would assume that um, I'd be interested in, I probably am. Amazing. Claire would like to know, do you think studying at drama school is essential for having a sec- a successful professional career? If so, what should you look for in a drama school? I definitely don't think it's, um, what do you say, if it's essential? Yeah, if it's essential for a... Yeah, uh, I, definitely don't, I definitely don't think it's essential. A lot of my favourite actors never went to drama school. Drama school, for me, I, I really needed to go to drama school because I'd never done any acting before and I, I'd barely seen any plays and I just needed to kind of have a little bit of time around people who were also interested in acting and also interested in theatre and to learn the real basics, you know. I, I really started from zero, so I had to go to drama school. But loads of people don't need to do that and it's a long time and it's expensive and you know and some of drama school is good some of it I would say probably isn't you know so it's it's by no means a be all and end all but like some people go there I went there and like you can have the best time of your life you can learn things that you'll use forever and you'll meet friends that you'll have on your wedding day and probably at your funeral do you know what I mean so like it can be a really formative experience as well so in terms of like a drama school I think you want to look at the atmosphere you want to look at the kind of people that have been graduating from there so like if you think about actors that you might admire you might want to look at what drama schools they want they went to if you 
can afford to, if you've got the time, maybe try and get along and see some third year shows because that that um they're often that I think they're pretty much always public and they can give a kind of insight into the types of actors that sometimes go to a certain drama school. But I don't really subscribe to this idea that Guildhall has a certain sort of actor and drama center has a certain sort of actor or whatever. I think like you will know when you're at a drama school and it feels right and it feels and you feel safe and you feel that you can be relaxed there because you're going to be there for many hours for many weeks for three years and I see you need to be somewhere that you can feel comfortable in. Um, Caitlin Jenkins would like to know um, do you find your approach to acting on stage different to working on screen and do you have a preference? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's definitely different because, well, I mean, there is a difference to it in the fact that when you're on get when you're doing a play, often you get four weeks or five weeks rehearsal, whereas when you're doing a scene on screen, you get four or five minutes. Um, so I think like a lot of screen work or preparation work you have to do kind of like by yourself and um, before you get to set or whatever so like if if I'm shooting a scene next week I should like learn my lines the week before and ask my questions and think about how I'm going to do it but I think the fundamentals of the actual performance are pretty similar it's, again you are searching for truth and you're searching, searching for spontaneity and honesty and being able to look to listen and respond to the person on the other on the other side of the stage or even on the other side of the camera you know with obviously with theatre, like it's important that someone can hear you five meters away and twenty five meters away. Whereas with screen, there's a microphone there to pick you up, and the camera's right there. So if you're too big, it ain't good. Um, <laughs> and trust me, I, I learned that the hard way. <laughs> but but yeah, I think the fundamentals are similar. So I I, I think if 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 as an actor you're always chasing truth, honesty, as opposed to tricks or whatever. Um, you should be able to work in both mediums. Um, this That links into a, another anonymous question. Um, we've had, I don't know why we've got so many anonymous people here. Um, uh, make yourself known. <laughs> uh, there's been a lot of stage shows released online um, digitally recently. Do you find that you can get the full experience um, from an online version of the play? Um, I mean, again, it kind of like depends what you think of as the full experience. Like if you're sat in the front row of the National Theatre and someone's doing a speech, you're probably going to get spat on. So if that's part of the experience that you're going to miss, yeah, you're, you're going to miss that. Um, and obviously the thing is like with um, an NT live or an RC live, whatever, like the camera kind of like chooses the bits of the stage that you can see and that you look at, and the, the actors that you look at. Whereas when you're in a theatre, you've got the right and the freedom to look at wherever you want. But I do think it's a really important way of get, uh, increasing accessibility to plays and giving people who don't have the opportunity to travel to London or Stratford or whatever and to see these great productions and this country does produce great plays and great performers and great productions you can't always get the opportunity to see them so I think they're they are great and uh, I, I, I'm, I think I'm a real advocate for them. Um, two interesting questions here from Megan um, they're very different but I'm going to read them both it was uh, she was Megan's interested to know how you got involved in co-founding in Vertigo and she would also like to know if you ever get starstruck when working with actors you admire. Okay, yeah, two good questions. I set up in Vertigo um, when I was in my final year at drama school. And that was um, about, I think for me, it was about agency, I think, um, artistic agency, sorry. I I was really terrified about the feeling of having been in drama school and having a certain amount of stability within that structure for two and a half years and going out into uh, an industry where it felt like all the agency all the power existed outside of me so laying the hands of agents or casting directors or directors or producers or people that weren't me and who I couldn't control you know so I wanted to take 
control of my destiny and be like, look, I'm going to make, I'm going to be a part of making plays and I'm going to be a part of making theatre and, and um, that, that's something that I can be in control of. Um, and I did it with like three other people that were in my year, three other boys that were in my year. And especially for the first couple of years, we had a great time and we did like some good plays and we did some terrible plays, you know, and, but we had a lot of fun and it taught us a lot about being artists as well as being actors within this industry. And I think that's something that we all got to strive for, you know, like Callum Murderer was talking about how he's an actor, but he's also a writer, you know, so like his artistry is way bigger than just being an actor where you're at the um, whims of like a script that someone else has written, you know, so it's about agency. That's why I did that. Um, in terms of being starstruck, I, I mean, yeah, I guess. Um, I suppose like starstruck means it has got like a slightly negative connotation to it, right? It means that you're kind of like frozen by the the, the greatness of the person that's in front of you. And yeah, I guess that's like, that would be quite unprofessional, I guess. Um, and you're not doing the task uh, that's put in front of you if you're doing that. But like, obviously, like, I, I, I just I just find me, especially meeting famous people, I find it so interesting because when you meet them in real life, they're often very different from what your mind's imagination of that person would be. They're often smaller, number one, <laughs> um, and they're often way more, way more normal and they've got all the same, if not more, anxieties and insecurities as you do. They're human beings. Everyone's human human being whether they're, they've got three oscars or whether you're doing a regional play with them in Scotland, you know so i think that I, I that actually always makes me feel much better i think when 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 i meet someone and they immediately humanize themselves or i i allow them to humanize themselves it makes it much easier to to treat them as an equal that's great now look we've got about five or so minutes to go so we'll just rattle through as many as we can um, Emily Pepper wants to know what part is the most fun that you've played? The most fun? and mm-hmm. um, probably Pizza Rat in The Mouse and His Child. <laughs> That's one of my um dearest memories. Yeah. I mean the seminal role, I mean, read the reviews, they'll tell you everything you need to know about them. I definitely <laughs> loved that. I loved that production a lot and it was an incredible cast and good people and yeah, I think the audience has enjoyed that. Great. Um, Ethan wants to know, do you prefer Shakespeare productions or more modern productions? Is that when I'm watching them? It doesn't specify. Maybe we should do both. Um, not necessarily. I think a good play is a good play. Actually, a good production is a good production. Um, you can do you can do bad productions of good plays and good. it's harder to do good productions of bad plays. Um, so, yeah, I think as long as a play is done well, I'm, I'm 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 a really easy audience member. I, lo- I love everything pretty much. Um, great, Isabel wants to know: Do you think drama schools should give more feedback on applications, and do you think it's okay that they ask for such high payment? Yeah, I definitely think the payment issue is something that needs to be rectified across the board. I know a lot of drama schools, Guildhall and Lambda particularly, are doing a lot of work in terms of making them um, making those audition fees lower because I do think it puts people off. And it's not fair. Um, what was the first question? Um, the first question was, do you think they should give more feedback? Do I think they should give more feedback? I guess it, I, 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 I work on the panel at Guildhall and I know that just the the, the, the sheer volume of people that um, audition, especially in those earlier rounds, makes it very difficult to be able to give feedback to everybody. Um, but like, yeah, if possible, for sure, if, if you can use it to learn from. Amazing. B wants to know, when you first saw your costume for Hamlet, how did you feel about it? What were your first thoughts? Um, well, I, I kind of like was quite involved in the design of that, of that costume. Like, and yeah, we, because usually you do a costume fit in the first or second week of rehearsals and we were in the final week of rehearsal and we still hadn't quite landed on what he exactly what he was going to look like so yeah I kind of like I was kind of pleased with it but like it wasn't it wasn't immediate it, I needed to wear it in you know like especially when I first wore it it was very very bright and shiny and like a little bit dazzling for anyone 
looking at it. So I needed to kind of like make it a little bit grimy and dirty. Great. Jess Clues. Are there any less obvious skills or personality traits that give you an edge in the acting industry? Um, to give to give you an edge, as in like generally, to give people an edge. Yeah, to give you, I guess, to give you as an actor an edge. Are there any skills? I think, I th- I think courage. I think courage is a really underestimated and other underspoken about thing when it t- when when people talk about acting because it's really scary and it's really and it requires you to bring a lot of yourself. It requires you to be vulnerable and it requires you to be truthful and it requires you to look stupid and all those things. And that's, I think it's important that we recognise that that's really difficult and scary and you've got to be brave to do that. So I think courage. That's great. I think courage is a nice one to end on. Um, So look, the results for the poll are in, Papa. And the story (laughs) that people would like to hear yeah. Is your first ever screen audition. Please tell right. me about that. Um, I don't even know how you know about this, Callum, but anyway, my first ever screen audition. This is this this is a real example of how um for one how like drama schools aren't necessarily like the be all and end all because I I was in my final year at drama school. I was like at the time I was really into like movement and physical theatre and like being expressive of my body, right? And so like I was auditioning for this um part in this like American series, it's called Da Vinci's Demons. And like the character that I was auditioning for was doing a scene where he had to like dig a grave or something. And to get like some sort of treasure or something like that. So like I must have spent like two, three days working after school in the gym, kind of like working on my mime work, thinking about how heavy the spade would be, kind of like trying to see what what it would be like if I really put my back into it. And it was like a like I'd made a big routine that covered like several square meters of like I'd walk over there and then and dig this bit and then walk over there and dig that bit and I was like feeling very confident about it and then I went to the casting director and (laughs) yeah I went to do the audition and the audition as it often is was in the casting director's house in what was essentially like a cupboard under the stairs it was it must have been like half the size of yeah it was tiny basically and there was a camera that had been set up and a chair in front of that camera and they were like okay can you sit down in the chair and we'll we'll do your audition and I was like oh don't worry I'm not gonna need a chair I've got got a whole thing set up so just make sure you capture it and she was like no 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 you've got that amount of space to do all of that and I was like uh okay and this is me with my brain panicking sweating heart hammering and I was like, so do, do you want all the, all of the grave digger stuff and everything? And she was like, yeah, yeah, just do it all. Just like very casually, just do it all with your eyes or whatever. So I'm there kind of like, <laughs> and like, yeah, the first part of the scene before the first line was a lot of action to do with grave digging. Obviously, the same thing to do would just to, would be to just ignore that and go straight to the first line. I instead, with my eyes and my imagination, tried to convince <laughs> the camera that I was digging a grave, moving to another part of the state, another part of the room, digging more of a grave, moving back, which must again have taken 25, 30 seconds. They must have thought I was insane after after saying action of just like that before saying the first time. I didn't get the job. <laughs> What a story. Um, that gives hope to all of us. Um, <laughs> look, that just about concludes Chatterbox today. But before we wrap up, Pat, I wondered if you'd be kind enough to share your lockdown list with us. Some things that the people listening can um, keep us, we listen to, watch, to stay creative in isolation. Yeah, well, I mean, I think we've actually already touched on it because I think I actually do think it's an amazing thing that a lot of the plays that... Um, that a lot of successful plays that have been put on in, in this country over the last few years have been made available over the internet. And I know the RFC have made, obviously, Hamlet, but, like, five other amazing productions 
that they've recently done available on iPlayer and the national are putting on play uh, the big plays each week on YouTube. I know the Globe Theatre have put a lot of their plays up, um, and a lot of other theatres around the country. There's actually a article on the stage right now, which I'll send to you, Callum, kind of, and maybe you can pass it around. That says that kind of has written down 50 top stage shows that are free to stream right now. And I just think that that's actually a really great opportunity because even when you watch a play and an amazing production of a play, you only ever get to see it once often. You only ever get to see what that actor is doing once. And I think this is, from an actor's perspective, in terms of being curious, this is a really good opportunity to watch and pause and rewind and rewatch and see and really, really analyze what it is about like some of these great performances that really resonates with you and really connects to you. So I think if like I'm definitely doing that, but I think that's a really useful resource that um that we haven't really had before and we might not have again post lockdown. So I think that's one thing to take real advantage of. That's great. Definitely send me that and I'll I'll send that out to everybody who's tuned in to yeah have a watch of now i'm afraid that's all we've got time for so listen thank you everyone for joining us um join me again next week next friday at 4 p.m when i'll be chatting to the start of jamestown on sky and the english game on netflix it is of course Nia of walsh now papa in the spirit of keeping the creative conversation going week to week i think you've got a question you'd like me to put to neve right um my question to you neve is right now during lockdown and everyone's talking about how important it is to start writing and how Shakespeare wrote King Lear during a lockdown 400 years ago or whatever. I just want to know what you think about that and if, you're, if you have any tips about how to get started, how to get that first word on paper in terms of writing. That's a great question. Tune in next week to see how Neve answers that. Papa, thank you so much for joining me for Chatterbox episode two. It's been so lovely chatting. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, mate. It's been a real pleasure. A final reminder to everybody that the reason we're here is to support the work of Playbox Theatre. Um, they really do need your support at the moment. Yes, you people out there, they need your support. Um, no donation amount is too large or small. So please head over to playboxtheatre.com forward slash donate and give whatever you can. And don't forget, you can see Papa in Gangs of London on Sky Atlantic every Thursday at 9pm, starting last night. Um, <laughs> if you've enjoyed this episode, or indeed any of the episodes, please go wild on social media. We're at Playbox Theatre on Twitter and Instagram, or facebook.com forward slash Playbox Theatre. That's it for this week. See you next Friday at 4pm with Neve Walsh. For now, stay creative and see you soon. Goodbye.